Well, happy Father's Day, and we're starting a new series uh, today, and it's really a, a picking up of a series we started back in January when we said our theme for the year was Greater Things to Be Done in 2021, and it uh, wasn't really hard because the bar was really set low in 2020, right? <laughs> greater Things to Be Done. Well, we're going to pick up a series here called Greater Things. Uh, and greater things for those who are followers of Jesus. And the first greater things is greater joy. In fact, my, my theme today is a godly father's greatest joy. And it comes from a, a, the little tiny letter of 3 John. And it's just a little tiny letter. It's like a, like a half a page in some Bibles. The whole book. And uh, in the fourth verse, the Apostle John writes this. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, we know if we connect the dots of the scriptures, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if Jesus is the truth, and John is writing, he's saying, my greatest joy, every godly father's greatest joy is to know that his children Know Jesus Christ as the truth. They are saved. They are walking with Jesus. Now, walk is a progress. You take a step at a time, step at a time. And, and what it is, it's, he's saying, I'm not expecting my children to be perfect, but I expect them to be making a step at a time towards Jesus. That brings a father the greatest joy. Now, it's not the only joy mentioned in the passage. He says, uh, that's not to say there aren't other joys, because the passage starts after introducing himself in verse 1 and verse 2. He prays, he says, dear friends, I pray that you may enjoy good health. I don't know of a single father who says, boy, I hope my, my kid has crummy health. You know, not at all. In fact, most of us, if our, our child had a, a need... You know, like uh, they had a kidney failure and they needed a kidney, you'd volunteer to give your own. I used to say to my brother, I said, hey, listen, if you ever needed a kidney, I'll give you one, but I'm going to make sure it's the one that's got the stones in it. <laughs> I've been down that route. <laughs> of course, he never needed it, so I still got my stones. But you know, you, you make those sacrifices. Those are the physical ones, the physical health. He's concerned, and every father is concerned, godly father is, about his child's physical well-being. We are. We invest in that. We have health insurance. We work to cover their bills. We, I, I, I think the, the, the figure the last time I saw is it takes about a million dollars to raise a kid. You know, if I hadn't had kids, I'd be a really wealthy man. <laughs> because you work, you, you invest. Why? So they can have Physical opportunities that you never had. Every godly father does that. In fact, I think every good father does that. The second thing I notice is that every godly father, his joy comes that his children have success. Dear friends, I pray that you may enjoy good health and all may go well with you. Everything may go well with you. I hope that you, you have a bigger house, a bigger car. I hope that you have a, a better vacations, everything than I have. Isn't that the dream of every generation to pass on to the next generation, even a better world than we have? Yeah, exactly. Some of us were fearful, you know, not because of the COVID or the vaccine for ourselves, because we're saying, well, we're kind of at the end of the journey. I'm afraid for my kids and grandkids. Isn't that right? Aren't we the same way about the financial debt of the nation? Wait a minute. Every time we add on to the debt, it's my grandkids, and they're going to have to pay for this. And so our concern is that we want them to be more successful than we are. Every good, godly father wants that. It's true. It's true. We go a little bit further, and it's, there's a psycho psychological health. Even as your soul is getting along. Do you know what the word soul is in Greek? It's suke. Do you know where it appears in the, in the modern English? In psychology. Now, it always baffles me when somebody is a doctor in psychology but doesn't believe in spiritual things. 
That just makes no sense. Because the suke is your immaterial part of you, who you are, that spirit. It's that part of you. And so to not believe in spiritual things and to be a psychologist is a contradiction in terms. How could you ever do that? You can't. The suke is that part of you, inside of you, uh, your mind, your emotions, your, your self-identity, your self-awareness, all of that is in your soul. And I believe the Bible uses the term soul in a sense of that I am aware on a horizontal level. I'm, I, I have all this awareness. It's my immaterial part. Now, it tells me in the last verse of, of, of James chapter 2 that death occurs when that soul is removed from my body. The body dies. So there's a thing called psychosomatic illnesses. What, what my soul, how, how my soul is doing well, will actually influence my body. And you know the other way? It works the other way too. You, you get sick and you're injured and pretty soon you have a thing you call depression. Why? It's because your body, they're, they're interlinked. And, and the moment a person dies, it's because the soul has departed from the body. And so here he's saying, I'm hoping that my child is psychologically got it together. I don't know if anybody says, boy, I'd sure like my kid to be a schizophrenic. You, you just don't want that. <laughs> Makes no sense. And so here he is. He says, dear friends, I'm praying. Even as your soul is getting along, I want your soul to be well. I want you to be inside connected. Now, the only way that happens is when that immaterial part of you, what we call a soul on the horizontal level, it's connected vertically. And when it's connected vertically, that immaterial part of you connected vertically, I think the scriptures use the term spirit. That means you have a spiritual renewal. It's being born again, born of the Spirit of God, so you now have a connection with God. You're part of the family of God. And so now you don't just view the world on a horizontal level but you are connected spiritually, and so he's wanting them to not just be horizontal, but be connected spiritually as well, which leads me to the whole thing. That's why he's praying. I pray, dear friends, I'm praying that you may enjoy good health and all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well, as you're spiritually being nurtured along. He says, I'm praying. Prayer is so important. And starting your children young is really important. Pray, modeling it, modeling it for it. Years ago, I was uh, having our evening devotional time. This is many years ago because my boys, which are now men, uh, my boys were at home and were doing our devotional time. And I got this book. I, I wish I could find it again because it was really good. It was on Bible doctrines for children. And I'm on the doctrine of the Trinity. And so I'm reading the, the, the passage on the Trinity, and, and we cover God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So the next night, I, 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 I'm there with my, my three boys, and, and uh, I got my oldest son, David, my middle son, Jonathan, and Jeremy's just a baby, but he's there too, because it's a, the family time. I, I'm opening it up, and I, I better do a review. I said, okay, last night we talked about the Trinity. Does anybody know who the people, the persons of the Godhead are in the Trinity? Man, they looked around like, what in the world are you talking about? And so uh, I said, come on, you guys, we just covered this last night. Finally, my middle son, he's small. He's probably about three. David's probably about five at the time. He chimes in, God the Son. Whoa, good job. I am so proud of you. And I look at his brother, who's older, should have known this. And he knows I got that look at him. I said, does anybody, can you name another person in the in the Trinity, and uh, nobody says a thing. Then Jonathan says, God the moon. <laughs> yep, here I was teaching them idolatry. <laughs> it is a hard concept to get across, the doctrine of the Trinity. We're in the same, a different book, and it's called The Bible and Picture for Little Eyes. And we get to the picture of Jesus on the cross. And we're doing the story with it. And my son says, Dad, I want to be saved too. From the picture, he couldn't read. I, I read the story. And so we prayed, and that's what this verse is saying. 
I pray. Prayer is our link to God. Our children need us to be modeled that I have this link with God. I talk to God as my father, dad's fathers. We need to show what it is that you have a father. You pray aloud to God in the presence of your children. He says, I pray for your physical being, your success. He says, I'm praying that you're, you're, you're spiritually inside, your soul is well. He's praying for these things. He's a praying father. He's a praying father. The fifth thing that I got here is he's concerned about. A godly father is concerned about his children's faithfulness, that they're reliable, they're dependable. We went out to Yellowstone and we saw the Old Faithful. Because Old Faithful goes off almost 60 minutes on the... Every 60 minutes, give or take a minute or two. That's why it's called Old Faithful. You can count on it. It's going off. Been doing this for hundreds of years, okay? Just going off, going off. And uh, he says here, it gives me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness. I'm not bragging about you. Other people are bragging about my kids. I don't have to put the bumper sticker on the back of my window saying that my kid is an honor roll kid. Everybody out there is telling me, man, you got an honor roll kid. You see what I'm saying? They're bragging about my kid. He said, this is what I want. He said, this is my joy that you are faithful. You are reliable. You're dependable. I can count on you. People count on you. What you say, you do. Your word is your bond. And there goes my phone. I don't know. I think the Lord's calling me again. <laughs> Old faithful. You can count on it. Isn't that what you want with your children? They're reliable, dependable, truthful. You can count on them. You can count on them. That you can say, no, that's not their character. When somebody says something about them, it's not quite right. You just know in the depth of your heart because there is a track record of honesty, integrity, truthfulness. They are faithful. Faithful. Notice what it says here, though. Not just faithful in everything and circumstance of life, but faithful to the truth. And who is the truth? Jesus is the truth. you got kids that are walking with Jesus. They're faithful to Jesus. So you really know you can bank on them because they're going to do what Jesus wants them to do. And then he says, not only did the godly father receive this great joy, because that's what it said. It gave me great joy to hear other people bragging about you and how faithful you are to Jesus Christ. And how you continue to walk in the truth. You take no time outs. You don't pause. You, every day. It's another step closer to Jesus. Every day. Every day. Every day. You know how they see that? They see that when you have a devotional time and they come across your daily bread that's been turned to the next page, and that's that day, or whatever devotional guide you use. They, they, when you pray, and, and you think no one is looking, and you're having your meal, and you pray, but they, they, they can watch you. They see you. They see you pray. You continue to walk in the truth. Now, sometimes there are obstacles in the way of your path. And so I call this perseverance because even when an obstacle arises, this child says, you know what? I can overcome this. And that brings a father great joy. Not a quitter. Not a quitter. This starts early in life. Your kid joins a league and then decides, oh, I don't like, I, I don't like baseball anymore. Well, you don't let him off his commitment to the team. You train him. You made a commitment. You stay with a commitment that you walk, you continue, you persevere, you walk in the truth. We were talking about music earlier and different one of us. Uh, what, what instrument did you play? Now, some of you probably know that I played. Hmm? Not a clarinet. The accordion. You know why I play the accordion? Because my sister quit. <laughs> I had this red, it was beautiful if you're a girl, accordion. It was red, and it shined, it sparkled and everything. And because she quit, 
And uh, all of us had to take a music lesson. I was forced to take the accordion. I can still do the, do the two notes I got on this finger right here. Those two, I, I just play those two, and I find that one button that's got the dimple in it, and I know I can play that one. And I can play, a, a, I can play my right hand a little bit, and, and, but I could never do them both at the same time. Get them to, it was driving me crazy. Right? My, my, my parents were wise. They knew that music, I, I didn't have, I don't have rhythm. So, so, you guys were clapping. I have to watch you clap. Or I, I'm, I'm not in sync. Line dancing. We were on a cruise. I didn't know if anybody on the cruise. My brother Jerry was there too. And we decided to line dance. In fact, he's right here. He's sitting in the front row and he's laughing. We decided we'd go out and line dance. We'll figure this out. We had messed that floor up so badly. We have no rhythm, no rhythm. So my parents are so wise. My dad says, I just don't think he's got it. <laughs> so what do they do? They enroll me in art lessons instead. Have I continued with that? Yeah, they found my strength. You see, a wise, godly parents find the strength of their child, want them to succeed, and my dad, my dad would sit and draw with me. And uh, sometimes his pictures were better than me, but I was only like in third grade. I mean, come on. <clears throat> so as time went on, my drawings were better than his, and he finally said, well, you know, you got this. You're on your own. <laughs> you got a teacher. We want our children to persevere, to hang in there, to, to overcome, to, to excel, to be something. That's what a godly father wants. Godly father wants. And then we get to the fourth verse. He says, He's had great joy in the words before. But now he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. A godly father's greatest joy is to know that his children are walking in the truth. I could probably flip that around and say a godly father's greatest sorrow is that his children are not walking in the truth. It's powerful, it's powerful. So the best influence for that joy to happen in a father's life, to have great joy, the best influence for that to happen is to be an involved father. You've got to be involved in your child's life. I know so often when a person's working, you know, I just don't have time. I've got overtime. I've got all these bills to make, pay. And, and that you can push your children out of your life. But a godly father is uh, the most, he's, he's the biggest influencer. If you want to have joy, you're going to have to make an investment. That's just the way it is. Just the way it is. This is from the childrenswelfare.gov. It's a government website that the following facts I'm going to give you. So I'm diverting from Scripture. I'm going to tell you what our government says, okay, about you dads, all right? Here we go. According to Psychology Today on their site says, the results of a father absence on their children are nothing short of disastrous. Now, having said that on a government website, you think they would do something about it, right? But you know the way government works. They tell you one thing and do something completely different, right? Children are diminished. They have a diminished self-concept if there is not a father in their life. First thing noted. They have compromised physical and emotional security. The very things our passage is complimenting and saying, this is what I pray for, that you will be successful and that you will have well-being, that you will be strong and healthy physically. A father's presence helps a child in all those, all those circumstances. Number two, behavioral problems. Fatherless children have more difficulties with social adjustments and are more likely to report problems with friendships and manifest behavior problems. Kids tend to act out when there's no strong father in the picture. It's amazing. Third, truancy and poor academics performance. 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless children. 
There's no father in the home. Fatherless children have more troubles academically, and they are scoring poorly on tests. Listen, just being in the house, your kid does better on his test. I don't get that. Do you get that? I don't get that. But that's what the government tells us. This is the way it works. They study this stuff. Fourth, delinquency and youth crime, including violent crimes. 85% of the youth in prison have an absent father. Wow. 85% of youth that wind up in prison have an absent father. Fatherless children are more likely to offend and go to jail, even as adults. That's amazing. Promiscuity and teen pregnancy. They are more likely to experience, that is, fatherless children. They are more likely to experience problems with sexual health, including greater likelihood of having intercourse before the age of 16, and foregoing <coughs> contraception during the first uh, intercourse, becoming teenage parents, contracting sexually transmitted infections, girls manifest an object hunger for males. Father absent daughters want a man in their life, and if they can't find one from their father, they'll go out and find one for themselves. Whoa. And they experience emotional loss of their fathers as a rejection of them and become more susceptible to exploitation by adult men. Wow. Fathers, fathers, fathers. Here's the sixth. You're probably wondering how many of these are there. I'll give you a heads up. There's 12. <laughs> Drug and al alcohol abuse. Fatherless children are more likely to smoke, drink alcohol, and abuse drugs in childhood and as adults. Wow. Exploitation and abuse. Fatherless children are at greater risk of suffering physical, emotional, sexual abuse being five times more likely to have physical abuse and emotional maltreatment with a hundred times higher risk of fatal abuse. Those who are abused and actually die, it's like 100% more than when there's a father actually present in the children's life. Is this amazing? This government telling me this. They know all this, and they're doing nothing about it. Physical health problems. Fatherless children report significantly more psychosomatic health symptoms. Oh, see that? Psychosomatic. Even they know there's a link with the way your soul is. And if you have no soul connection with God, you're in big trouble. Psychosomatic because your soul, the way you feel on the inside, determines how you're going to feel in your body. And your body is going to have all kinds of problems. Listen, this is what it says. They have more psychosomatic health symptoms and illnesses such as acute and chronic pain, asthma, headaches, stomach aches. My son came in to me one day and said, Dad, I got a headache. My head hurts. My head hurts. And I said, oh my goodness, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, Dad, I'm thinking about eternity. It goes on and on and on. It's making my head hurt. <laughs> you see how your thought your thought affects your body. Even a kid can tell you that. And that was a good thing to think about eternity, that there's got to be something more than this life. But when you think of some things, remember what it says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What we got going on on the inside determines what we're going to be on the outside. And if there's no father, just that absence of a father is a step in the wrong direction, the way they're thinking on the inside. It is, it is. Ninth, mental health disorders. I, I was just talking about it. A father, absent children are consistently overrepresented on a wide range of mental health problems, particularly anxiety, depression, and suicide. This is amazing. Ten, life change. As adults, fatherless children are more likely to experience unemployment, have low incomes, remain on a social assistance, and experience homelessness. Isn't that what every dad wants for his kid? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. These are amazing. 
Future relationships, father absent children, tend to enter partnerships earlier, are more likely to divorce or dissolve their cohabiting union, and are more likely to have children outside of marriage or partnership. Wow. Mortality. Here, listen to this one. Fatherless children are more likely to die as children and live an average of four years less overall if they don't die as children. Wow. This stuff, this is mind-boggling. It's mind-blowing. Now, I want to shift gears because that was all from the government. A European group did a study also on what is the influence of fathers spiritually on their children, and their benchmark was Fathers going to church. Fathers going to church. Okay? That's their benchmark. If both the father and the mother attend church regularly, 33% of their children will end up as regular churchgoers. One out of the, he's got three kids, one out of the three is going to be a regular churchgoer just like you are. 41% of that 100% will end up attending church. Irregularly. They still go, but they're not regular like you are. <laughs> okay. See? Only a quarter, 25% of their children, will end up not practicing at all. That's what they found in this European study. If the father is irregular, watch this, and the mother is regular, watch the impact of a father here. Only 3% of the children will subsequently become regular attenders themselves while a further 59% will become irregular and 38% will be completely lost to the church. Men, your presence speaks volumes. Speaks volumes. It impacts more than you could ever imagine. If a father is not practicing and the mother is regular, she's faithful and true, only 2% of the children would become regular worshipers. Is that mind-blowing? Here you've got this godly woman and she's going, she's faithful, and she's bringing her kids, but her husband had nothing to do with it. The kids are learning more by his example than all the things she's saying and doing. This is this mind-boggling, folks. 37% will attend only irregularly, and 60% of their children will be lost completely to the church. In short, if a father does not go to church, no matter how faithful his wife devotion, only one child in 50, 2%, will become a regular worshiper. Is that amazing? Is that amazing? If a father goes irregularly to church, regardless of what the wife's devotion is, now, it's not that he's not attending, he's just irregular, between 50% and two-thirds of their offspring will find themselves coming to church regularly or occasionally. Isn't that amazing? The man has such an influence over his children. You know, I, I said it like a week or two ago. The mothers do all the nurturing. I mean, they, they nurture, they nurture, and they do all of that. And the dad just has to show up. That's it. Just has to show up. When he's there at the game, if the dad is there, it makes the child seem protected, secure. They, they, they play harder. They play better. If the mom shows up, well, that's great because mom's there for everything. <laughs> dad, you're just so important, so important. Church is the same way. A non-practicing mother with a regular father will see a minimum of two-thirds or 66% of her children ending up at church. She's not even practicing, but he is. They will have bigger impact on those kids. You see, it's just reverse opposite. This just blows me away. In contrast, a non-practicing father with a regular mother will see 66% of his children never darkening the church door. If his wife is similarly negligent, the figure rises to 80%. You, know, you drop out, your kids will be dropouts too. Your kids will be dropouts too. All right, all these findings may have been for Switzerland. I knew it was in Europe. But in the article, it says, from conversation with English clergy and American friends, this, the, the one that did the study said, I doubt we would get very diff different findings from similar surveys in the United States of America. And I tend to agree with him. He said, well, why are you showing me all of this? So what's the point of all this? Here's the point. Dads, 
You are the greatest influencers on your children and on your own joy. You're a great influencer. I'm telling you, just show up. Just show up. Just show up. Jesus was about to embark on his ministry. He's 30 years old. John the Baptist is about to baptize him, not because Jesus had any sin, but he's identifying with a sinful nature, and he's going to carry their sins to the cross. So John the Baptist is there, and Jesus goes down in the water, and John says, what are you doing? I'm not worthy to, to unlatch your sandal. And he says, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness. As he is baptizing, heaven opens up. They call a manifestation of God a theophany. There's a theophany here. It says, God's voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? God showed up in his son's life. Isn't that amazing? I could show you other places in the Bible, same thing. Jesus, when he prays, he prays to his father. He's got a relationship with his father, and that's what we want. We want to be fathers who influence our children. I want you to think about this. Your father had an impact on you more than you ever thought. He shaped you in ways you don't even know. Your dad did that. He shaped you. Give him the honor he is due for where you are on this Father's Day. Give him the honor he's due. And I know some of you are saying, well, what if I didn't have such a great dad? Pastor, I know that you talk about you've had a great dad. But what if you didn't have such a great dad? Listen to me. You can have one. You can have the greatest dad in the whole world because Jesus taught us this. Our Father. That's what he said. The disciples said, teach us to pray like John the Baptist's disciples pray. And he said, okay, here's how you pray. You say, our Father. See, the key here is, you have a Father. You have a Father in heaven. If your earthly Father fails you, you look to your heavenly Father. And if he's not your heavenly Father, you need to make him your heavenly Father. You need to call on him and say, Lord, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. God, be my Father. Our Father, which art in heaven, he says, holy is your name, your kingdom. You rule, God. (laughs) You're in charge. Your will be done on earth. In my life, just as it is done in heaven. Give me today what I need, Lord, my daily bread. Whatever it is I need today, provide it for me, Lord. And Lord, forgive me because I mess up a lot. I got a lot of messes up in my life. I owe a lot of correction. I'm a huge debtor. Just like, Lord, I'm going to forgive everybody who's messed up against me. (laughs) Okay. And do not lead me in temptation, Father. You know what I'm susceptible to. Oh, my. Guide me away from the things that will pull me down. But deliver me from evil, the evil one. For truly yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You see, what you need is a father in heaven. Like Jesus had a father in heaven at the important moments of his life. The father showed up. Dads, that's what we got to do. We just got to show up. We're not the nurturing ones. We just show up. Just show up in your child's life. Just be there. Just be there. You see, you can become the greatest dad in the whole world. And I just say it like this. Just show up. (laughs) Just show up. Your child just wants you to be there. I read a book not, uh, well, now it's been some time ago. It was talking about who has the strongest bonds in relationships. A study that was done showed that teenage boys have the strongest bonds. That's interesting. They get this heroic bonding thing going. That's why the young men that are in the military and bond because they're in combat together have a bond that is like nothing else in all all of life. It's just they're bonded. The article went on to say they weren't like the girls. They didn't talk much. They didn't talk much. What bonded them is that they were just there. They just hung together. They worked on a project together. 
I tell you what, you don't have to say many words as a dad. You just have to be there. And when the questions are asked, you'll know what to say. Even if it's, man, I don't know. That's all they want to hear, the truth from you. You don't have to take a big class on this. Just be in your child's life. And you'll be the greatest dad in the whole world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this passage where it tells us our greatest joy as fathers is to know that our children are walking in the truth. Lord, we're the ones that shape that. We're the ones that bring that joy about in our own lives by just being there for our kids. Lord, help us be better impacts on our children by just being there and showing up in their lives. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.